All right, so we're beginning a new series uh, this weekend. It's entitled Grace, Period. The reason I, I wrote a, a book, which will release, this is a, a pre-release uh, copy uh, from the publisher, Grace, Period. It'll release April 2nd. I believe, in my opinion, uh, it's one of the most important books I've ever written. And I know what God's done with the blessed life all over the world and 40-something languages and all that, but I wish every person would read this because it will completely, totally change your life, I promise you. The reason I titled it Grace Period is because we're saved by grace, period. We're not saved by grace and. We're not saved by grace plus. We're not saved by grace, but. I hear a lot of that. We're saved by grace, but. No, we're saved by grace. And I'm talking about salvation. I'm not talking about sowing and reaping. I'm not talking about consequences of sin, whether you're a believer or unbeliever. I'm talking about how you're gonna to get to heaven. Now, I know we're saved by grace through faith, okay? I got that. We're gonna read that scripture. But as far as by the word B-Y, it's by grace, period, even though we have to receive it. Does that, did everyone get that? Okay, the reason I'm saying this is because when you got saved, you knew it was just God's grace, that you were getting saved. You knew you didn't deserve it. But five years later, 10 years later, 30 years later, after you're a group leader, after you've learned how to use a Bible software, and even you found out what a Greek word means and how to look it up, and you don't sin as much as you used to, you know, you don't, uh, uh, smoke or cuss or chew or go with girls that do, you know. <laughs> now that you're a little better or maybe a lot better, maybe it's a little bit grace and your good works. But I'm gonna nail it down for the next four weeks that it's grace, period. And if you have any type of works or legalism in you, it's going to rise up. I can just tell you, you're not gonna like some of it because you're gonna to wanna to say, but, and I'm not, you're gonna not say it out loud, I'm sure, but on the inside, I'm gonna be saying, no buts, it's grace. And the reason I'm saying this, I promise you, is when you catch it, you will live the most joyous life a life of gratitude, a life of thankfulness, because you'll know I was only saved by grace. Now the name of this message, this first message is called Right Standing, Right Standing. And I named it this because of something that happened a while, a long time ago, uh, but with Debbie and me, we, we had um, a discussion. You know, before you get saved, it's called an argument. After you get saved, you say, we had discussion. <laughs> but what happened was, it, it wasn't her fault, but she said something that triggered something in me that had not been healed yet. And it hurt me. And she could tell that it hurt me. And so she tried to make it right, but made it worse. I'm sure none of you have ever done that, okay? Um, but it seemed like she was actually um, kind of saying that she didn't say what she said. And then the further we got into the discussion, the more she said things that hurt. But she didn't mean to, okay? So when that happens, we've learned, you know, we've been married 43 years now, and this was a while back this happened, but we've learned to pray. Okay, we need to pray, because the enemy's trying to get between us. And then we've learned to process. 
And when we prayed, she said something came back to me when I was praying. She said, when I was young, I moved something one time. I put it somewhere. I took something, somewhere in, something in the house, and I didn't put it back where it was supposed to be. And uh, I can't remember what she said, her mother or father, but one of her parents said something like, who put this here? And she said, when I knew that I was not in right standing with my parents because of it, she said, I said, I don't know, but I'll put it back. And I said, because, you know, she's, I'm married to Mother Teresa, you know, so I, if, to find out anything she did wrong growing up is wonderful to me, you know, it's just wonderful. <laughs> but I, so I said to her, she said, you know, she said, I put it there. My mother, let's say, said, who put this here? And instead of saying, I did, and I'll put it back, she said, I don't know, but I'll put it back. And so I said to her, so you lied. And she was like, well, now, I wouldn't say it was a lie. <laughs> I said, no, that was a lie, because you knew. And she said, and that's the way I felt the other day when we were talking, that I knew I wasn't in right standing with you. So I was actually kind of trying to cover it up, not just admit it. And so as we talked, I said to her, I said, Sugar, you, you don't have a, a, a correct understanding of right standing. I said, right standing is about relationship. Our relationship is we're married. Your relationship with your parents uh, was that you were their daughter. I said, they weren't going to kick you out of the house over that. You weren't out of right standing with them. Just something was wrong that needed to be talked about. Same way with you and I the other day. Something was wrong we need to talk about, but I wasn't going to divorce you over it. You were still in right standing with me. And, and her parents are humans and I'm a human, but what about God? So I really want to know are you in right standing with God because you do right things? Or do you do right things most of the time because you're in right standing with God? Are you all following me? All right, so we're going to look at Romans because uh, Paul is really, really trying to get people to understand this. So he uses, he's talking about our salvation, but he uses Abraham as an example. Romans chapter four, verse two says, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. Once you remember the word boast, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now we'll get to the boast in a moment, but I want to see the words believed, accounted, and righteousness. I'm going to take those three as my points, but I'm going to do them kind of backwards. So we're going to talk about righteousness first, right? So here's number one. What, what is righteousness? What is righteousness? Uh, righteousness is a noun. Righteous is the adjective. Most people believe that this is righteousness is someone who does right things, but that's not what it is. I'm going to actually read you. It, it actually means right standing with God. That's where we got the title of the message. But I'm going to read you the Strong's Concordance Greek word definition of it, all right? Just part of it, not, not all of it. But I just want you, it's a little uh, deep, but just, just stay with it, all right? Because it's really good, all right? Here's the definition from the Strong's Concordance. The state of him who is as he ought to be. The state of him who is as he ought to be, the condition acceptable to God. In other words, it's as you want to be, but you're not. But God's made you that. He's made you righteous. He's put you in right standing with him. So this is for us to understand that God puts us in right standing completely and totally by grace. And here's what it says. If Abraham was justified by works, he could boast. Please hear me. No one in heaven 
is going to come up to me and say, I'm here because of me. No one. No one's going to say, I earned it. No one's even going to say, I kept the faith. I'm telling you, when you see the nail prints in his hands and his feet, you're going to say, it's because of him that I'm here. Only Jesus. That's the only reason I'm here. There, there'll be no, let me say it this way. It says he won't have anything to boast about. Let me put it in Texan for you, okay? Ain't no bragging in heaven. <laughs> Nobody's going to be bragging that this is why we're here. Now, let me show you another verse. It's kind of deep again in Romans, but it's important for us to catch. Romans 5. Romans 5 is one of the best chapters in the Bible. You ought to read it in several different versions, all right? But Romans 5, verse 17 says, for if by the one man's offense, that's all about Adam, death reigned through the one, through Adam, much more, now watch this, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. I know, again, that, that is, it's like a long sentence, right? But it says people who do something will reign in life. So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because everybody would. How many of you would like to reign in life? That'd be all of us, right? Okay. How do you reign in life? You receive grace and the gift of righteousness. And by the way, it's an abundance of grace we receive. All of us, an abundance of grace. So those who reign in life are not good performers, they're good receivers. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> those who reign in life are not the ones that act right, they're the ones that receive grace. And when you receive grace, you receive the gift of righteousness. It's completely and totally a gift. All right, so let's just say, if I said to you, uh, Pastor Lorena is a righteous person, what would you think that means? You would think, think that that means she does right things. Now listen to me, stay with me, okay? And you'd be right. You'd be right. If I said she's a righteous person, that means for the most part, she does right things. That's where the word righteous, okay, righteous, take the E-O-U-S off the end, and it's right, okay? It comes from the word right, okay? But does she do right things because she's righteous, or is she righteous because she does right things? See, when you get it backward, it messes up all your theology, completely and totally. You're not righteous if, because you do right things. You, do, you want to do right things, let's say, because God gives you the gift of righteousness. Are, is everyone following me on this? Okay, so I have friends to this day that in my opinion, they're 99% grace and 1% law, 1% works. They're really good people. They're great people. And they really believe in grace, but their grace has a but to it. You know, I believe I'm saved by grace, but. Okay, let me tell you what that is. 1% works is 99% pride. Because your salvation is still based on you. And if it's based on you, you lost it a long time ago. Everybody, everybody in this room, even my saint of a wife, Debbie, because I saw her lose it a few times, okay. <laughs> but she didn't lose it, her salvation, because that's based on grace. I, um, I was talking with this friend of mine who's a good guy, really good guy, but he just couldn't get grace. And he kept just saying, but... But, he kept saying it to me a lot, but. So I finally had this analogy come to my mind and I said to him, hey, if your wife does something wrong, are you gonna divorce her? And he said, well, no, of course not. I said, oh, so you're a better husband than Jesus. 
And he just sat there for a minute. I said, yeah, that's what you're telling me. I said, you're more loving and more forgiving than Jesus because you're telling me you're not going to divorce your wife if she does does, does something wrong, but you're telling me Jesus is going to divorce you. And yet he said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He even said, even when you run out of faith, I'll still be faithful. Even when you're faithless, that's the exact verbiage. Even when you're faithless, I'm faithful because I can't deny myself. See, when you understand, God really didn't make the covenant with you, and we'll talk about that. He made the covenant with himself. That's why the covenant can't be broken, the new covenant. And you believe, and you get in on it. It's incredible. But I remember when I said this to this guy, I said, so you're a better husband than Jesus, huh? I remember just sitting there kind of looking at me, and I could see it hit him. And then I saw his eyes fill up with water. And then I saw this tear come down. And he said, I've never thought about that way. And I said, yeah, and you'll never be the same either from this day forward. Once you realize that Jesus is better at forgiving than you are. See, what is righteousness? It's right standing with God, and it's a gift. It's a gift. So that leads us to point two, did Abraham earn it? Did Abraham earn it? Well, let me show you what we earned, all of us, what we've all earned. Watch this, Uh, Romans 6, 23. For the wages, that's what you earn, wages, of sin is death. Just wanted you to know what you've all earned. You've all earned death. That's what you've earned. And this is talking about eternal death. You'll see the, the context in just a minute. But the free gift, sure would love if everyone understood the word free. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And then watch how clear it is in Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. All right, let me say that another way. If it's earned, then it can't be a gift. But if it's a gift, then it can't be earned. Does, every, does everyone get that? So it's, it's, you've got go to go, go one way or the other. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, it's a gift, but then I have to keep earning it. You can't do that because otherwise it's not a gift. If it's a gift, it's not earned. If it's earned, it's not a gift. All right, okay. So um, let, me, let me illustrate this, all right? Um, let me, uh, let me do like, uh, it talked about it was accounted to Abraham as righteousness. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do three accounts here, all right? First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna do an, the account of um, a bad person, someone who's bad, okay? So, uh, okay, I got someone. This guy is really bad, I've known him a long time. And he's a bad, he's bad. I mean, he's bad. I even know his thoughts, and sometimes his thoughts are not good. So, all right. Um, So then we're going to do a good person. Got it. I know a good person. Known her a long time (laughs) as well. So there's a good person. And then let's do a, a perfect person. Anyone know a perfect person? Oh, Jesus, there you go, that's great, Jesus. He's perfect, all right? Then, let's have us a little code down here. Um, S's are gonna stand for sin, and R's are gonna stand for righteousness. All right, that's a long word. All right, righteousness, okay. Um, Okay, so, if... S's stand for sin, R's for righteousness. Let me show you what Robert looked like before he got saved, all right? (laughs) This is what my account looked like. (laughs) Oh, and I, I did help a lady across, a little lady across the street one time. 
So I had one R in there, okay? Now, I got saved at 19. Debbie got saved at nine. This is what her account looked like before she got saved. She just had a whole bunch of R's. But remember I told you about the thing with her parents, so she had a little S in there. <laughs> and I'll bet she had a couple more of these. <laughs> but you know what? I just remembered a scripture. Isaiah 64, 6. Look at this scripture. Even our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. So rags begins with an R too. So even Debbie's righteousness says, these are actually rags. And they're filthy. <laughs> no, this actually makes me feel good because you had more, you had more filthy rags than I did in your account. You were filthy before you got sick. Filthy. Jesus' account looked like that, right? No sin, perfect. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. All right. So what happened when Jesus died on the cross? So let's take away that for a moment. Let's start all over. Got three accounts. So God took all of the sin in the whole world and put it in his son's account. Red is uh, for the blood. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, if you don't believe me, you want me to read you the scripture? I don't even have to come over here. I, could, I got it memorized, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He knew him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God. So at nine years old, Debbie believed, and when she believed, God put righteousness in her account. And at 19 years old, I believed, and when I believed, God put righteousness in my account. That's grace. That's grace, period. Let me give you a, a little saying here. Salvation is not a goal to be achieved. It's a gift to be received. It is not a goal to be achieved. It's a gift to be received. So, what did Abraham have to do? That's point three. What did Abraham have to do? Well, before you say nothing, he did have to do something. He had to believe. Abraham believed. And it was accounted to him. The counted is an accounting word, account. He, he was put in, righteousness was put in his account when he believed. Uh, John 6, verse 28, they said to him, to Jesus, these are the Pharisees, what shall we do that we may work the works, works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And now let's go to me, probably the most famous scripture on grace, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace, by grace, you have been saved. Already done, already taken care of once, through faith, once you believe. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should brag. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're created for good works, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. So I just want you to notice something. We're created for good works. God wants us to do right things, but... We're not saved by good works, we're saved for good works. We, we don't do good works and that gets us saved, we get saved 
and then we want to do good works. Is everyone following? So see, from a very young child, Debbie already had that feeling that when she did something wrong, she wasn't in right standing with her parents. If she said something wrong, she wasn't in right standing with me. But that's not the way God operates. Because we are put in right standing because Jesus did what was right, not because we do what was right. And we believe. Um, uh, James and Bridget uh, shared last weekend, and, and I, if you weren't here, it was fantastic. I mean, you, you want to go back and listen to it. You know, they did great. Um, James was our strong-willed child. Okay, that's the church way to say that he was stubborn. <laughs> but I mean, he was really strong-willed. And I mean, like, he had this baseball cap that he wore all the time. I mean, he slept in it. We would go in, take it off after he fell asleep, hide it, and we'd come back the next morning, he'd have it on. <laughs> I don't know how. Uh, it's crazy. And then I told him one time, you know, we're going, you know, we're going to church and you can't wear your cap. And he was like six years old, he, and he said, I'm not taking my cap off. And I decided, you know, instead of the normal discipline thing, I would just use, you know, psychology on him, you know? So I said, well, if you don't take your cap off, you can't go. He said, okay. <laughs> and then I decided to use the Bible way to get him to take his cap. You know, I just, okay, if you don't take your cap off, then, you know, we're gonna have a discussion about it in the other room. You're not gonna like it either, so. Um, but he just got more and more strong-willed, and all of our kids, you have to know, probably between five and eight, walked the aisle, made the decision for Christ, and you can get saved as a child, but what I've noticed is that many people, when they get between about 15 and 25, they have to make a grown-up decision if they're gonna follow God or not. That's why a lot of people once they come here and we're offering baptism, they decide to get baptized because they realize it's time, it's time for me to make a grown-up decision. I was actually went to the doctor's office for a follow-up on the cardiologist thing this last week, and they called me back to another little waiting room, and then this guy came and got me, and I thought, oh, you know, wow, they're already taking me back for the test, you know, thing, and, uh, but he wasn't. He took me to another place, and there were four people in there that wanted their pictures with me. So, um, <laughs> but it, it, they were all wonderful people, all wonderful, and I had a great time. And, but this guy said to me, this is really cool. This guy said to me, he said, uh, he said they hadn't come, when they come get you, I'll, you know, but he said, I'll let you go. If I, can I share a little testimony? And he comes to the church here. And so I said, sure. And so he said, I was... We moved here, and I was on my second marriage, and that one was about to end, too. And he said, every weekend I'd go out drinking. And my wife said to me, when are you gonna stop going out drinking on the weekends? And he said, I'll tell you when I'm ready. Don't ever ask me that again. When I get ready, I'll tell you when I'm ready. And so she then said a few weeks later, well, could we go to church somewhere on Sundays? And he said, yeah, if you can find a church that has a service afternoon." So she looked all over and Gateway Church has a one o'clock service at most of our campuses. So she told him, so she said, he said, okay, I'll go. So they walked into the um, uh, foyer and there were baptisms right there. And he said, I just stopped and just stood there for a minute. And she said, uh, are we going in? And this way he said, I'm ready. Just like that, he said, I'm ready. And he got baptized that day and he said, that was in 2018, and I haven't had a drink since then. <laughs> then, he, then, he, then, he, uh, then he told me, he said, and then I heard your teaching on the blessed life and about tithing and giving the first to God. And he said, I thought, I can't, I can't give the first to God. We can't even pay our bills. He said, so I got the book and I read it, and I thought, well, I have to give the first to God. It's not mine, it's God's. I have to return it. 
So he said, we started tithing. He said, I've been trying to get a new truck. And he said, I, we've been tithing just a few months. And he said, we were driving by this Ford dealership. And he said, I felt like the Lord said, go in there and see and buy a new truck. And he thought, well, every time I do it, they tell me I'm $10,000 upside down on my truck and I can't get a new truck. And so he just started tithing now for a few months. He went in there and they came back out and they said, hey, uh, yeah, we can, we, we can trade you out for a new truck and we can get you 1.9% interest. And he said, well, but what will it cost me? And they said, well, um, can you do $500 down? And he said, what about my truck? Am I upside down? They said, no, you're not upside down. So he said, I bought a new truck. And he said, I thought, well, you know, my wife needs a new car too. And so, <laughs> so he said, they went back the next week. And he said, can we get my wife a new car? And they said, yeah. And they, again, he said, can we get the 1.9%? And they said, yeah. So he did it. And then after he did it, Ford Motor Credit called him and said, listen, we've changed your interest rate. And he thought, yeah, that's what I thought. He said, yeah, they, we took it from 1.9 to 0%. So I, I'm just saying, I'm just saying to everybody here, get baptized and start tithing. All right, so let me go back to James here. So James was, I just, that was extra. James, James was really strong-willed. We even had a discussion where I was about to send him to live with his grandparents. I mean, I, he, when he was 15, I was just so fed up with him. And Debbie intervened. She literally came in and cried and said, y'all, please work this out. I don't want James, you know, leaving, you know, and so. And so we worked it out and all. But anyway, um, just a few months after that, he just changed. I mean, he just changed. We would go in in the mornings to wake him up for school, and he'd have his Bible on his chest where he fell asleep reading his Bible. He, he started obeying his mother and saying, yes, ma'am, and he was a teenager. <laughs> here's, here's, listen to this. He started being nice to his sister. That's a miracle. <laughs> That's a miracle. You know, when your kids get grown, it's, it's, it's unbelievable the stories you hear because they know they can't get spanked anymore or grounded. So they just, they tell you, well, yeah, and we snuck out and we, you know, we stole a car. They tell you all sorts of stuff. <laughs> you just can't even believe it. <laughs> so <laughs> Elaine told us, said, you know what they used to do to me when you used to leave me with them? Josh was like 13, James was like 10, Elaine was like five, you know. So we figured Josh, he's old enough to babysit. We don't pay for babysitting anymore, you know. And so she said, do you know what they used to do? And James and Josh said, yeah, we did that. He, she said, well, they used to hold my head down and tell me to pray about it. <laughs> okay, so James starts being nice to his sister. He starts obeying and being respectful to his mother. He starts reading his Bible. Like, and it's like a month, and this is still going on. So we're at dinner one night, and I said to him, James, you've really changed. I mean, you've really changed over this last month. And then you got to know James. When he eats, he's pretty focused on, on eating. He doesn't look up much when he eats, you know. So he's just like this. I said, you've really changed. And he went like this. That's probably because I got saved. <laughs> and I said, you got saved? He said, you know, about a month ago. I said, when did you get saved? He said, when you shared your testimony at the, at the youth service. <laughs> I said, were you gonna tell us? He said, I figured y'all notice. <laughs> he started doing right things. But he did, did he become righteous because he started doing right things? Or did he start doing right things because he became righteous? You see, he believed and righteousness was put in his account. Right standing with God. I just want you to know, if you believed you are in right standing with God even if you've blown it because you're in right standing with God not because of your performance but because of Jesus' performance and what Jesus did for you on the cross.
I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to just ask like we do every weekend, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Just take a moment. Just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Because so many people live with guilt and shame and with a works mentality. And I did show you, we are saved for good works. God does want us to do good works. But we're not saved by good works. And we're saved through, through faith. It's very important, obviously. You have to believe. But we're not saved by faith. We're saved by grace through faith. Now, you know what's great about this message? Is you can get saved today. You can get saved right now. Just give your life to Jesus. Just do what Abraham did. Just believe that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God made getting saved the easiest act in the world. You know why? Because he tells us in Peter that he doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to eternal life. So you just have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins, and he rose again on the third day. And then give him your life. And when you do, I'm telling you, you might say, well, I, I, I can't change, Pastor Robert. I've tried to change. You don't have to change. You just give Jesus your life. He can change you. He's the one that does the changing. He changes you. So you can do that right now. And then in a moment at every campus, we're going to have people here at the front. And it's very important. Here's one other verse you really need to hear. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before others, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. So here's what I'm asking you to do. If you are giving your life to Jesus today, there are going to be a lot of people coming for prayer because you can come for prayer at Gateway for any, any reason. If you need a job, if you, uh, something going on with your finances, your family, your health, your kids, your relationships, your friends, whatever it is, you can come and ask for prayer. So there are going to be other people coming for prayer. But if you gave your life to Jesus today or if you want to give your life to Jesus or if you want to come back to Jesus, then you come also and just say to someone here at the front, I, I want to be saved today. I want what happened to James to happen to me. I want to be saved. I want to give my life to Jesus. And we'll help you, all right? Lord, I want to tell you thank you, thank you, thank you for making salvation so easy. If we just believe in Jesus, then you take our lives and turn them into something so beautiful and so wonderful. And Lord, I pray for every person now that prayed that prayer to give their lives to Jesus or just need prayer in any area. I pray every person that needs prayer in any area would just come and let us pray for them. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to get the truth of grace down deeply in our hearts. In Jesus' name.